good to be with all of you this morning. It's good to see such a, a great crowd out on a very cold winter's day. I dodged the bullet this week. I was telling Randy earlier, originally I was supposed to be at, uh, for work, I was supposed to be in Minnesota this week, um, in about six miles from the Canadian border where it's, I understand, about eight degrees and two feet of snow. So I'm glad that I didn't have to go. Um, this is a little better, but, uh, um, but it's good to be with you guys this morning. You know, I thought this morning as we reason together from <coughs> the scripture, I wanted to look at a concept that I think we find there several times. Um, and it's something that Jesus really addresses a lot in, in John the 8th chapter. Uh, just the idea that, that he puts forth, of, or that we see is, who is your father? And that's kind of what I want to think with you about this morning, the idea of, of who is your father. And as we kind of go down that path a little bit, you know, it's interesting to consider, you know, that one of the defining characteristics of who we are sometimes is a family line, uh, who, who, where it is that we came from. And it's really interesting to see the similarities between parents and their children. Now, when I was a little bit younger, I really didn't care about that too much. Um, but as I have been privileged to get older, um, you know, not only do I see that as I look towards my father and, and my family, and there, if you happen to know my dad, there's a lot of people who would say, yeah, you sound just like him when you're talking, or you, you guys gesture the same way when you're, when you're speaking publicly or teaching class or something like that. And my kids will tell you, yeah, dad, you sound like grandpa when you said that. Um, sometimes that's good, sometimes that's bad. Uh, <laughs> but, but also now as I look backwards, uh, you know, I see the same things in, in my daughters or in my son. That I, I see them take on some characteristics that, that, that myself or their mom do or have some mannerisms or phrase things the same way. Um, my daughter sends me videos every now and then. My oldest daughter, she's out in Denver. And, and as she's sending me videos, sometimes she's riding with her husband. I hear her making these comments about, hey, that light's green, you need to go ahead and go, and things that she probably heard me say when I was, <laughs> when she was riding with me. So it does all come back to you. But, um, but my point about that is, as we think about that, you know, we see that, when, that we are heavily influenced by um, who our, our family is. And, and the idea of a father, in particular, we see in God's word as we think about Jesus and his father and some other characteristics there. And, and that's why I want to examine that with you a little bit this morning. Um, it's not just the physical that we see. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes there are mannerisms, sometimes there are mindsets. That's why the phrase that's out there, like mother, like daughter, or he is his father's son. We use those phrases to describe things that we see in children um, that remind us how much we are influenced uh, by those who gave us life. And I think Jesus plainly shows this same truth is evident in the spiritual realm as well. So when you look in John the 8th chapter, and we're not going to read the whole chapter by any means, but you know the beginning of that chapter, starting uh, at the first part of it, uh, the Pharisees come and challenge Jesus uh, about you know trying to, to kind of trap him in something. They bring him this woman who's been caught in adultery, and they have some back and forth about that, and Jesus wisely answers them and, and sends them on their way. And he's kind of setting the stage, I think, for some things he says later in chapter 8 about people's motivation and that and the people are following after that which they have been influenced by or, or that whom they are committed to. Uh, and he uses the idea of fatherhood a little bit later in the chapter. But even there as he continues on in chapter in verse 13 and 14, you know, that he's challenged again by the Pharisees there, um, you know, as they, as they try to, to catch him in something and Jesus tells them about his uh, his true self and where he came from. He says there, the Pharisees came to him, you're a bear witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. He's basically, they're basically calling him a liar about him saying who he is. And his answer there is, he says, even if I do, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going. But you do not know where I came from or where I'm going. He's challenging them that those who should know the scriptures and know that the Messiah was predicted and that he fits all of those things, and that he is, you might say, his father's son, uh, that, that they can't see that. And even down a little bit further in chapter uh, 8 and verse 18 and 19, you know, he kind of bears this out specifically in the mindset of what we want to think about this morning. Um, you know, they, they say, he tells them that if they knew the father, they would know him. 
And that's kind of interesting to see there. He says in verse 18, I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. They said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you, neither, you know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. And there's this, this thing that we start to see here in chapter 8 that, that he lays out for us and shows us um, that we need to consider who our father is in a spiritual sense. <laughs> because it tells about who we are and tells what kind of motivations we have and, and how we're going to go about living in life. And really you see as he continues on throughout this chapter, there's a couple of different things that, that we want to consider. The first one is this. There are two paths that we can be on. There are two paths. And I think Jesus bears that out as he starts here uh, to talk about this further in verse 23 and verse 24 of chapter 8. He says there, he said to them, you are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. And see, he starts to lay out the fact that there's, there's two places to go. There's two directions you can take here. Uh, he goes on to say, I told you that you would die in your sins, for unless you believe that I am he, you will die in your sins. And Jesus is very clearly showing us here that the path to eternal life, or the path to what is good and true and right, is following him. And Jesus has already said that he is like his father. And that's what I want to think about this morning with you too, is, you know, who is your father? We'll get to that, that point here in just a few minutes. But, but first, let's think about this idea that there are two paths that you could be on. And just consider what some of them are as we just kind of run through some scripture here and appreciate this concept that we find uh, in the Bible. You know, there's, there is the will of God or there is the lust of men. And as you look at all of these paths, you'll see one of them follows the Father, just like Jesus says, I am of the Father, and one of them follows the world. And so look at what Peter says here in 1 Peter chapter 4 and, and, and verses 1 and 2. He says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with this same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their early lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. And so Peter, as he, he kind of concludes this first letter, he puts in contrast the idea of you can live for the will of God, you can live for the lust of men. And he kind of shows us where each path will take us. The Galatian writer says the same thing. You know, as Paul writes Galatians, uh, and there's several verses that we'll read together here, it's the idea of are you going down the path of being led by the Spirit? Or are you going down the path of gratifying the flesh? And notice what he says here. Familiar passage, maybe, but consider all the things that go into this here as Paul writes this, uh, this very pertinent verse. He says in verse 16 of Galatians 5, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, through all these passages, the path is clearly defined. And that's what we need to notice, because sometimes as we go through life, we start to get off of the path that we should be on, and maybe we stumble and then find our way to, to some place that we ought not to be, but the paths are clearly defined, as Paul points out to us here. In verse 17 he says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with one another, so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law, or you do not gratify the flesh, as he says in some other versions. Um, in verse 19, the acts of the flesh are obvious, sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. And so Paul does what he often does in these types of situations. He gives these lists or catalogs, is what I like to call them, of things that the brethren ought to consider. He tries to give them specific examples of, if you're a part of this, this is the path you're on. And in this sense, before he gets to the, the fruit of the Spirit, he's telling them, here's the path of the flesh. And But as Paul often does, as an educated man, he doesn't just limit it to those things. He gives good examples, and he says, and the like. So he's telling you things that are self-serving, things that are not of the Father, that's the path to the flesh. And that's not the path that you want to be on. Those are not the things that are going to help you inherit the kingdom of God. But rather, in verse 22, he says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, 
gentleness and self-control against such things there is no law and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires since they live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit and I like the language of how this reads here as we think about all of this because there are two clearly defined paths and what he says here at the end if we're going to live by the spirit let us keep in step with the spirit or let us uh, do those things that, that show that we are of the Spirit, that we're following after our Father, God. And so you think about the idea that there's these two paths, and we continue to see that as we, as we think about the Scriptures. There's either being of God, or there's being of the world. John writes it this way. He says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. And he's talking in this chapter about testing the spirits and testing those who would come and teach maybe things that were against the will of God. And in comparison to that, he's calling them who are the children of God. He's defined them uh, earlier in, in another chapter. He says, you know, you are of God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So you see this continual contrast that the writers of the New Testament put forth for us about things like that. It says they are from the world and therefore speak from the viewpoint of the world. The world listens to them. We are from God. And whoever knows God and listens to us, knows God listens to us, but whoever is not from God does not listen to us. This is how we recognize the spirit of truth and the spirit of falsehood. And you know, John who wrote first John, you know, said said it back in the book of John in, in verse chapter 15 and verse 19, if you belong to the world, it would love you as it loved its own. I mean, he's writing what Jesus said here, I guess is what I should say. These were the words of Christ. As it is, you do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That's why the world hates you. And I put those two verses out there for you to think about because we see very clearly you can't be from both. And that's what you want to notice about these two paths as we see them throughout these different passages. There's there's one path that goes this way. There's one path that goes this way. One is following after God. One is following after the world. And in so many different places, we see that. And we see Jesus point that out to his followers, just, just like he does here. He tells them the path following God may not be the easy one. And we need to appreciate that as well. Because certainly as we go down our path of life, we can see that sometimes it's not easy to be a child of God. And we're tempted by the things that are around us. We're, we are you know, drawn sometimes to the things of the world. But, but remember, as we think about these two paths, that our affections are either going to be for the Father or they're going to be for the world. And notice how John writes it here. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. We just see time and time again, the two don't go together. Um, he goes on to say, for everything that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. He's talking about the eternal destiny that is there. So as we think about all those things and kind of wrap this, this idea up about there, there being two paths, we have to recognize that we are either children of God or we are children of the devil. We don't like to say things that way sometimes because that's, that's, that's a pretty blunt statement, but the reality of it is that's what the Bible shows us. We're on one path or the other. Notice how John writes it here in 1 John chapter 3. He said, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. Notice he says, he doesn't say that we never sin. Because we all fall down sometimes. But because of the grace of God, and because of our mindset, and hopefully that we're on the path of following after God, we're not practicing sin. We're not living sinfully. And that's what I think he means by that here. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning because God's seed abides in him and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. And so you think about all of these things together, these, these two paths that are there. It's either the will of God or the lust of men. It's the spirit or the flesh. It's, it's being of God or being of the world. It's being of the Father or being of the world. It's being children of God or children of the devil. Think about things in a physical sense. Is it possible? Is it possible for someone to have two fathers? Biologically, that's not possible, right? I mean, sir, we, 
there, there are situations in life where we may have adopted parents and we may be raised by another family, but when it comes right down to it, and you think about your genetics and sometimes your characteristics, it's not possible to have two fathers. And so as we, as we think about that and, and, and consider some of these other passages that kind of point that out, it's impossible to be the child of two fathers. What does what is Matthew report about that? In Matthew 6, 24, no one can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You know, and he says this in the context of the worldly idea of money. You know, you can't serve both things. You can't be totally devoted to, to physical wealth and be devoted to God. You know, he points this out in a couple of different places throughout God's word, that we can't serve two different mindsets. There are two paths, and we're on one or the other. We were talking James this morning in Bible class. Remember James 4 and verse 4? You probably read that a couple of weeks ago. You know, the writer there says, You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to become a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. We have to remember there are two paths. And choose which one we're going to be on. So, as you think along those lines, though, not only are there two paths, there are also two hearts. That's what helps us choose what path we're going to be on. What kind of heart do you have? And, and as you think about that and look through God's word, you can see that, that concept as well. There is the idea of a rebellious heart. And if we have a rebellious heart, it's going to send us down the path of serving the world rather than the path of serving God. And so when we start to think about who is my father, it, it comes down sometimes to what kind of heart I'm willing to build, what kind of heart I'm willing to have. Where does my faith take me in the kind of heart? So... Look at this. Look at it this way. In the rebellious heart, we see different things that show what that means. In John 12, Jesus was, was getting ready to reveal to them what it was that was going to happen. He was going to be lifted up on the cross. Uh, you know, the, the works of men were going to do that. And he says, now is the time for the judgment of this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And he, he draws a contrast between him and between Satan and the mindset that they have. Satan was a rebellious heart. Jesus had a heart that was willing to serve God, willing to do the will of his Father. And time and time and time again, we see that. And we'll see that here in the next point when we talk about a receptive heart. But think about the idea of a rebellious heart. That's the nature of Satan. That's the nature of the children of this world. And back to John 8, that's where Jesus was going with the Pharisees as they had been you know, butting heads with him and arguing with him and trying to trap him all through what's recorded there in John chapter 8, the woman with adultery, the, uh, you know, who's your father, where did you come from? Notice what he calls them out and shows them about their rebellious heart here in chapter 8, starting in verse 42. It says, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? Is because you cannot hear, or you cannot bear to hear my word. And he goes on to say this in verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and has nothing to do with the truth because there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. Think about what kind of heart that is that Jesus is talking about, that Satan has. And he's telling them, don't have a rebellious heart. Right now, it looks like you do, and that's the path you're going down. That's the, that's the message he's preaching to them there. He says in verse 45, but because I tell you the truth, you do not believe me. Why? Because they have a rebellious heart. They're not willing and wanting to receive the things that God has so graciously sent them, his very own son. And they're fighting against that. And Jesus calls them out because of that. Verse 46, he says, which of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is because you are not of God. He's calling out their rebellious heart. And as long as they maintain that rebellious heart against the will of God, against the things that he prophesied would come, against what he wants them to do. I mean, these are spiritual leaders of the people of Israel, right? The Pharisees. They're one of the sects that were, were educated and should, should have been spiritual leaders. But, but Jesus is telling them here, as long as you're going to reject God's word, you're not going to be able to see what's, what needs to happen. 
It's the rebellious heart that they have that, that keeps them from being able to do that. And Paul writes about those things and, and others in Romans chapter 1 a couple of different times. Um, I just picked a couple of verses out for us to think about here. At the end of the chapter of Romans 1, he says, he's talking about those who have rejected the truth of God. Verse 18, he talks about those who, those who suppress the truth and, and, and live in unrighteousness. And talks about all the different practices that they're involved in. They deny creation. They deny, or they deny the nature of God. They can evidently see through creation. And in verse 28, he says, And since they did not see fit to acknowledge God, why not? Because they have a rebellious heart. They want to serve themselves. Not They want to rebel against God. God gave them up to a debased mind to do what, it, what ought not to be done. He talks about what some of those things are. In the last verse of that chapter, he says this. He says, Though they know God's decree that those who practice such things deserve to die, they not only do them, but give approval to those who practice them. I think that's, that really points out the idea of having a rebellious heart when he says that they know the decree. They know that what they're doing is wrong. They know the truth of God. It's evident. It can be seen. But they choose not to do it. That's a rebellious heart. You don't want to have that type of heart in what we're doing. You know, if you think about this idea of the rebellious heart, I'll, I'll leave you with this last verse about that here in Ephesians chapter 4. Um, I've got verse 18 on the screen. We'll read verse 19 too. But, but, you know, as Paul writes about the same kind of concept, the idea of someone purposefully deciding to, to ignore the things that they know or that, that they could know about God. In chapter 4, verse 18 of Ephesians, he says, They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, Due to the hardness of their heart. It goes on in verse 19 to say, you know, they have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. You know, he tells them, you know, don't walk like the Gentiles used to walk. Don't be the kind of people who, nor, who typically rejected God change. Don't be like this. And that's what we want to appreciate when we think about it. That there are two hearts. And one of them is the rebellious heart. That takes us down the path of, of, of following, of going away from the will of God. But rather what we want is to be able to have a receptive heart. And that's what we saw in Jesus. What's significant to note about that is how many times Jesus said that he was like his father. And if we want to say that we are of God and we want to go down that path, then we need to be like Jesus, and we need to be like the Father, too. And that comes from being able to have a receptive heart. Notice what he says first about that as we think about Jesus' mindset of things. In John chapter 5 and verse 30, we think about having a receptive heart. Jesus says, by myself, I can do nothing. You know, this is the Son of God. But yet he's, he's submitting to the will of his Father. He's showing the receptive nature of, of his heart. He says... I judge only as I hear, and my, and my judgment is just, for I, do not to, for I do not please myself, but him who sent me. And when we think about what Jesus did, and what he was willing to do, even in the, the most stressful of times in his earthly life, it helps us appreciate what it means to have a receptive heart, receptive to the will of God. You think about that scene in the garden in Matthew 26. You know, there's many verses we could read about that. But just look here in verse 39 as Jesus talks about it. We see it recorded, the attitude that he has. It says here, going a little farther, he fell with his face to the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me. Yet not as I will, but as you will. When you think about what he was about to suffer and what he could have done about it, that he could have stopped it by just speaking words, but yet he's willing to go through it. Hebrews, the Hebrews writer, the Hebrew writer talks about him uh, going out with vehement cries and supplications. We can imagine what someone was about to endure, not just the physical, but the mental part of that. But we see his receptive heart, and that's the kind of part that that we long to be a part of, that we long to have. John says it this way, in John chapter 6 and verse 38, it records these words of Jesus. Jesus says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. And, and, and first John, he writes about this, he talks about the kind of heart that we can have as we look and see what Jesus did for 
that that's the kind of people we want to be. John says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And notice, notice the phrase he puts after that, for his, and his commandments are not burdensome. I don't know if everybody in the world would agree with that. I remember being in high school, and, and, and sometimes some of the, the choices that I made to not be a part of certain things, I got ridiculed a little bit. And you know, I remember hearing, well, you guys have a lot of rules at your house. You, know? you have to do this, and you have to do this. And, um, you know, that's how sometimes people with a more rebellious heart will look at it as, well, you're restricted in what you can do, or you can't do this, or you can't enjoy this. That's really a rebellious, self-seeking heart instead of a receptive heart that's trying to do the will of God. His commandments are not burdensome. Right? We think about what it means to be a child of God, what it means to be like our Father. And, and I think that's one of the things that John is pointing out here. You know, the psalmist even had this idea in the Old Testament, I delight to do your will. Oh my God, your law is within my heart. So as we think about the idea of that, that there are two paths, there are two hearts, and we can clearly see which side of things we want to be on, the question comes down very simply to this. Who is your father? And I'll leave you with a few questions to think about uh, this morning as you consider that. Who is your father? Well, you know, we've talked about what it means to be someone's, to, to, to be related to someone. So first you have to think about this, you know, who do you look like? In a physical sense, we can sometimes see the similarities between fathers and sons or mothers and daughters, but who is it that you look like? Well, think about what Jesus said here in John chapter 14 and verse 9. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long that you still uh, do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words I say to you, do I, not, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. And so when you start to think about, well, who do I look like? Who do you sound like? Who do people see when they see you? Do they see Jesus in you? Do they see you as a Christian? Or do they see something else? So if you want to think about who is your father, you have to think about who it is that you look like. In the 10th chapter of John, Jesus said it this way. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the father knows me, I know the father. I lay down my life, the sheep. So Jesus talks about this intimate relationship that he has with those who are his followers. So in a spiritual sense, who do you look like? That tells us who your father is. Paul encouraged those that, that he wrote to to imitate him as he imitated Christ. He wasn't saying, be like Paul, but he's saying, be like Paul as long as Paul is being like Christ. He said the same thing in the same type of thing in Philippians 3, in verse 16 and 17 there, as he, as he looks towards those who are following after God, who look like their father. He points out there, only hold true to what we have attained. Brothers, join in imitating me and keeping your eyes on those who walk according to the example that you have in us. So that's one thing you have to think about. Who is it that I look like? The other thing you think about is, well, from whom are I looking? <clears throat> am I learning the ways of the world, or am I learning the truths of God? That tells me, uh, that tells us who our Father is. You know, John chapter 17 and verse 17, very simple verse that we may know by heart. Sanctify them in truth, your word is truth. If that's what you're taking in, if that's what you're filling your heart with, then you're going to look like your Father. However, there were those who weren't taking that in. Paul writes about them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and verse 10. He says, and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing, because, why? Because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, just like we saw in Romans and like we saw in other places, God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false in order that all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but had pleasure in unrighteousness. I like how Paul words that there because it's not just talking about someone who maybe got it wrong or slipped off the path or was ignorant. No. He's talking about those who had pleasure in unrighteousness. That's a choice they made. It's a choice that they made not to know the truth. And so, who are you learning from? That tells us who your father is. So which one are you drawn? That's something else to think about. You know, what is your motivation? It goes back to that heart. What kind of heart do you have? To which one are you drawn? Well, 
in John chapter 3 and verse 19, what does it really tell us about Jesus there? It says, and he says, and this is the judgment, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people love the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his works be exposed. Whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that the works have been carried, that his works have been carried out in God. It's a, it's a real simple concept that Jesus puts forth there. You know, light exposes error. Um, you get to this time of year, and, you know, when I get up to go to work, I try not to wake up my wife. And because in, in our bathroom, we have these windows that, uh, I don't know why I did this when I built the house, but I put windows between the bathroom and the bedroom. So if you turn the light in the bathroom on, and it's dark, it shines in the bedroom. <laughs> not the smartest thing. It looked neat when we did it, but... Um, so in the winter, sometimes, you know, I'm trying to get ready to go and I'm trying to shave. It's a little dark. I have these little candles that I turn on. They're kind of dim so I can see what I'm doing. But when it's, you know, time to brush my teeth and maybe shave, you know, I end up holding that candle like really close so I can see what's going on. Um, I don't want to walk out into the light and find out that, you know, I didn't do such a good job. You know, even though I know my face pretty well and I look, I've looked at it every day for 50 plus years, I still need the light. You need to see what's happening. And if you think about just a simple example of, of that light exposes truth. So who are you drawn to when you think about who is your father? You know, are you afraid of the light or do you welcome it? And that's, I think, what Jesus is pointing out here in one sense, is being able to welcome the light. In, in John 6, and verse 44, he said this, No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up on the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they will all be taught by God. Everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. There's a drawing power of the cross. And he talks about it in John chapter 12. And those who, who want to do God's will, who are receptive to that, are going to be drawn that way. To which one are you drawn? You think about who is your father. And, and the last question is this. Which one are you following? Pretty simple to think about, isn't it? Hopefully worth following after Jesus. Second Peter chapter 3 and verse 18, as Peter ends that, that letter, he says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be both glory now and forever, uh, now and to the day of eternity. Amen. So hopefully that's where we're growing. That's who we're following. Because we recognize from what Paul writes in Romans chapter 6 that whatever one we're following, that's the one that we will be slaves to in a sense. Uh, he says there in verse 16 of Romans 6, Do you not know that if you present yourself to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey? Either sin, which leads to death, or obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you were once slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. So we have a choice as to which one we are going to follow. And that's going to show who our Father is. Paul said it this way in Romans 12. He appealed to them to think about things, and he said, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. And in verse 2 he says this, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. So you have confirmation in opposition to transformation, by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. I'll leave you with all those thoughts this morning to, to consider this. Who is your Father? We have seen as we look throughout these things that, that, that we are going to be, we're going to look like who it is that, that we come from. And in a physical sense, we appreciate that. In a spiritual sense, it's going to be what we decide to devote ourselves to. Which path will you be on? Which heart will you have? Who is your father? And if we can help you discern that or sort that out this morning, you know, that's one of the reasons that we assemble together. To study, to encourage, to uplift, uh, and sometimes to correct if we need to. Maybe you need to take the, the, the first steps and be on that path of being baptized into Christ and, and, and follow your brother Jesus along uh, with and make God father that he should be to you. Maybe you need to repent of sin and turn back to your father. We see as we think about the prodigal son that God is always willing to accept back those 
who are willing to turn to him with open arms. And we appreciate that we have such a wonderful father in that way. Can we help you with one of those things this morning? If we, if you can, please, if we can, please let us know how by coming to the front as we stand in this song. Would you let for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him within the narrow road? 